Wi-Fi traffic is rising sharply, and my guest today, William Webb, says that we'll need another 1,000 megahertz or one gigahertz of spectrum to support Wi-Fi by 2025. We'll dive into all the details in just a moment. All right, everybody, welcome back. My name is Klaus Hetting, and I'm the host of Wi-Fi Now TV. Now, this, of course, is the interview program that brings you all the great stories and not least all the great people from across the Wi-Fi industry now. I hold in my hand, this hand, a brand new report. It looks like this. There, you can read it. And uh, it's, called, it, it's called the Wi-Fi Spectrum Needs Study. It was com commissioned by the Wi-Fi Alliance and co-authored by my guest today, Dr. William Webb of Quotient Associates. And as you will know, Wi-Fi traffic continues to rise and we will need sooner or later a lot more unlicensed spectrum uh, to support it. So William has written this excellent, uh, excellent report that projects uh, spectrum needs towards the year 2025. And we'll ask him all about the results in just a moment. Now, and of course, this is a super important uh, topic and, uh, and uh, we're covering this in detail because you really need to know about these things. But before we get into this, remember that uh, I also need to do my usual personal plug here that Wi-Fi Now, the expo and conference is going to Washington DC this April 18th to 20th. We've got more than 40 great speakers lined up to give you the latest insights on Wi-Fi business and technology. And we've also got dozens of exhibitors to show you the latest and greatest in Wi-Fi solutions. And so if you're in the Wi-Fi industry, this is the one yearly event you're not gonna to wanna to miss. So be there, and if you're interested in exhibiting or some other role, uh, you better be quick. We've got a couple of spaces left for, in our expo, and for all the details, go to wifimelodins.com slash USA. If you have any questions, drop me a line at klaus at wifinowevents.com. All right, my guest today is Dr. William Webb, outspoken analyst and veteran of the wireless industry. Friend of the show, I have to say, William, 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 welcome back. Thanks, Alf. Good to see you. So, William, uh, you authored this excellent report. I printed it out, uh, at least a piece of it is about, I think, 40 pages long or so, which is not long, not any yes. standard report of this type, but it's very well written, by the way, about, very concise. The executive summary, I think, is something like six pages. It's very, very much uh, worth reading. So anybody out there, you should definitely get a hold of a couple. We'll get you the links and stuff later. But William, please summarize for us uh, the results of your Wi-Fi spectrum study. Sure. So uh, as we all know, data traffic is growing. It's growing very quickly across all our different kinds of communications. And of course, that puts increasing strain on all the various wireless technologies that we have, not least Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is working pretty well at the moment, as we all know, with one or two slight exceptions in really dense areas. But of course, as that data traffic grows, then that situation will change. So what the study did is projected data growth forwards using figures that are available from companies like Cisco and others. And through a quite detailed model, looked at what that did to the traffic on access points in three different scenarios, an office scenario, a residential scenario, and a shopping mall kind of uh, urban scenario and looked at how much spectrum would be needed, taking into account all the advances in technology we expect to introduce new generations of Wi-Fi, in order to ensure good throughput for users and to avoid excessive congestion. And in short, the answer was that under our normal growth assumption, by 2020, we'll need something like 500 megahertz of additional spectrum in and around the five gigahertz frequency band. And that will grow to about a gigahertz by 2025. Now we also ran a, a high growth scenario because of course nobody really knows what's gonna to happen to traffic going forwards. And onto the high growth scenarios, those numbers approximately double to one gigahertz by 2020, two gigahertz nearly by 2025. Now the numbers vary a list a little from region to region because each region has got a slightly different allocation of Wi-Fi spectrum at the moment. So depending on how much is available, depending on how much of that requires the DFS mode of operation and so on, we change those numbers. But I give you a good overview for the typical kind of amounts of spectrum we think will be needed over the next five to ten years. And the input to your model was. Um Known sources as, for example, the Cisco VNI and other well-known, uh, yeah. well-corroborated sources, right? 
That's right. Now, uh, there are many different projections looking forwards. And of course, we're looking not just at uh, mobile growth here, but also at growth in residential traffic, because Wi-Fi, of course, is used a lot in homes, in which case the growth in the home broadband connection is what we're most interested in. So we put together a number of different kind of, uh, forecasts to show um, some that Ofcom UK regulation has done for home broadband and others. Um, and we gave them pretty good sanity check because you know, I've been a regulator myself for some time and I've seen far too many reports that simply assume extraordinary growth uh, and you look at them as a regulator and think, well, that's just an unreasonable assumption. So we try to be quite pragmatic and to use as much as possible available information. But having said all that, of course, nobody quite knows what is going to happen. So uh, it's best to have a few scenarios in there to bracket the range of growth. Well, I was, uh, my impression when reading that, uh, this is that I also think it's a very, um, uh, what's the right word? It, 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 it's a very uh, solid and conservative approach. Not, you know, I mean that in the best possible way to, to projection. There's no hype in there that I can find and you use uh, strong sources and you document, of, of course, everything that you do. So I thought it was an excellent report also in that sense. Um, so so here's the, the question. I think on everybody's mind after they've read this is that are these spectrum needs uh, you know, achievable and will regulators allow this and where's all this spectrum going to come from? I know they're the very big questions here, but please go ahead and see if you can answer any of that. Yeah. So uh, if you take a step back at the very highest level, of course they're achievable in so much as we're looking at frequency bands in and around five gigahertz. Um, and therefore, you know, a gigahertz above that or gigahertz below that clearly is possible. You're not bumping up against um, the bottom end or the upper end of the frequency band. So uh, there's no fundamental issues. But of course, what we know from spectrum use is that all spectrum has some utilization for incumbents. Mm -hmm. Clearing those incumbents out or sharing with them is always difficult. There's always a number of different competing claimed on spectrum from a wide variety of different user groups, some governmental, some private. And so it's not going to be easy. I mean, nobody, I think, assumes that. Mm -hmm. It is going to require um, a lot of study. It's going to require a lot of consideration as to whether sharing or not is possible. Uh, it's going to require phasing in in time to allow for incumbents to, to prepare for this or to, to move to other places. There's a lot of work to do there. But in principle, it's possible if there's a will to do that. And I think there should be, because as we all know, Wi-Fi is so critical to our daily lives. Mm -hmm. that I can't think of a much more important use of the spectrum than dedicated mm -hmm. to that particular application. And I should say the UK is making good progress in this space, right? Because uh, they have, at least as I understand it, announced plans to release more uh, yeah. Uh, of five gigahertz spectrum for unlicensed use, is that correct? That's right, yeah. So they, they've got a number of stages to their plan and they've announced a, uh, an immediate release uh, of, I think it's between one and 200 megahertz of spectrum. So mm -hmm. moving in the right direction. And also they said they're gonna be looking further at uh, other needs in those frequency bands. So mm -hmm. uh, it does show that regulators are aware that it's important to make enough spectrum available mm -hmm. for Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. But I don't think at the moment they really understand the magnitude of that. So yes. we need five to 10 times as much as Ofcom is currently making available. Uh, yes. and we need to make it clear why that's needed. And hence the importance of this report and the importance of getting this message out, which is what we're trying to do today. Do you have any insights as far as the US allocation of unlicensed bands is concerned? There's obviously been some change in administration and so on. And, and I know the previous administration was uh, 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 very positive on at least some of the commissioners were very uh, positive on allocating more uh, unlicensed bands. I'm, I'm not so sure now. Do you have any insights? No. So, like you, I've been um, awaiting to see what we'll hear from uh, the FCC with its uh, new chairman and, and so on, whether that will change. And there's certainly been uh, a fair degree of speculation, but I've not seen anything specific on that. So, mm -hmm. Um, it's something to monitor very closely, uh, and it may be that more attention is needed in the US, depending on the views of, of those in the FCC. 
All right, William, now that I have you, we do need to, we do need to pop a few more questions at you here because there has been, I don't know if you've been following this, but there has been recent talk in the media. It all came, I think, from a Bloomberg business yeah. uh, article uh, a couple of weeks ago or something like that, uh, or maybe even less, uh, talking about the death of Wi-Fi given unlimited mobile plans. Mm -hmm. And we were a bunch of people in the Wi-Fi community who were all over that saying, of course, that makes no sense. Uh, what's your view on that? Would you care, would you care to comment? Yeah. Um, I think it makes no sense. Uh, so my, my, my take on that is, first of all, uh, unlimited data plans only apply to cell phones, not to laptops or other things that are only Wi-Fi connected. So clearly those devices still need a Wi-Fi connection regardless of what happens on the cell mm -hmm. phone. Right? Secondly, if you look at things like the Cisco VNI predictions, they actually predict increasing percentage of offload to Wi-Fi, not decreasing. And they're taking into account all the data they can find on things like tariff plans. So the best forecasts that we have uh, show that Wi-Fi is taking an ever increasing role. And indeed, if we look at things like Google's Project Pi, we can see companies starting to say, well, actually, let's go for a Wi-Fi first kind of approach rather than cellular. Now, of course, that is still something fairly embryonic, but nevertheless, it points the way forwards. But then I think if you look at it from the mobile network operator's point of view, they're actually struggling to meet the demand on their network. They're getting some more spectrum, that will help them. Uh, and they're refarming to 4G, which is giving them more spectrum efficiency. But they're still struggling to keep up. And it seems to me virtually impossible that they could suddenly shoulder all of the load from Wi-Fi as well as the growth that they have to handle and still stay in business. And indeed, it's not clear to me either why it's in the interest of the mobile operators to want to pick up all that Wi-Fi traffic. They're not going to get paid for it um, because yeah. we send data over Wi-Fi for free anyway. So I'd be paying more to send it over cellular. So none of, none of that seems to make sense to me. So I don't believe at all that we're, we're going to see the makes, best one. Makes, makes no sense to me either. And I actually came up, I think, with a nearly identical analysis. It took me all the three minutes to do that. and. Yeah. And I just do not understand whether you, how they fabricated that story. I think it's actually awful that they can come with that. Well, anyway, we probably talk all day about that. Um, yes. So I, I, I do need to ask you a couple more things about the, the, the study. Uh, and I think this is an important question. Are there any disruptive factors, uh, 5G, Y gig, LTU, that, yeah. that you think could impact this prediction? Because right now you, you, you have strong confidence in your results. Obviously, given all the all the uncertainty of projections and so on, but at least on the basis of the methodology, but what do you think are are things that could potentially disrupt this? Sure. If any, so actually, we we ran a number of different scenarios to look for that kind of thing in the model, uh, and one thing that would reduce the requirement would be if Y gig really took off in a big way uh, and was able to shoulder a very large amount of the data traffic. Now, in our model, we use Y gig. You've got to assume that its range is relatively low because of the frequency bands it operates in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the amount of traffic it can actually capture is a, a, a fraction, only 10 to 20 percent of the total traffic. Mm -hmm. But if we were in a world, let's say, where there were wide gig nodes everywhere, you know, many in a room, then that could change that. But that just doesn't seem viable. And indeed, the backdoor problem then becomes a significant one. So I don't really believe that, but it's one to watch. In yes. terms of like um, on licensed LTE or similar, actually at a high level, I don't think much changes. So if you take a step back and ignore the underlying technology, you're using the same device, the handset, that's sending the same data in the same frequency bands to the same access point. And the question is whether it uses Wi-Fi technology or LTE technology, both of which are FDM, uh, and both of which have similar modulation and coding schemes. So, at a higher level, it doesn't really seem to make much difference to the amount of spectrum you need. You simply divide it between different technologies. Now, that ignores questions like whether one would interfere with another and actually cause a degradation in the overall throughput. Mm. And we didn't really study that because I think that's a different question. And if, it, if there was a lot of interference, then potentially that could cause issues and require more spectrum. But YG is an interesting one, actually, because we didn't, don't really know that much about it yet. I mean, there's a handful of companies and no more than that working on YG at the moment. But it's and there's a lot of spectrum there. But uh, we have yet to see how this, you know, how this will evolve, or whether it's promising at all. I think it's promising, but maybe not for the same application. That, that's right. And, and certainly the insight that we picked up was more or less what you said, that, that it is interesting, but 
nobody quite knows yet where it's going to play out. It certainly has roles in, for example, very short range things like linking a laptop to a screen without a table. But then that's something that's not done at the moment. So that's an additional source of traffic and it's mm -hmm. not uploading five gigahertz traffic. Mm -hmm. I think we need to wait and see. And I think it will be quite some time before that really evolves into what it might be. So it might perhaps change our 2025 predictions, but I don't think it will have evolved sufficiently to change the 2020 predictions. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. And, and for the last question, and I, and, and I have to bring this up because uh, your colleague, good colleague that I know very well, Dean Bubbly, has been uh, kind of talking about this a little bit, and it's about using Wi-Fi and license bands. And I remind you, this is not a joke question. It actually kind of started as a joke way back when I had uh, uh, the CEO of Republic Wireless on here, and he mentioned it, and we both laughed. And since then, I don't think that's where it actually started because people have been thinking about this for a while. But then it's kind of been become an interesting idea of using Wi-Fi in in licensed bands and using the benefits of the sharing uh, techniques there. Uh, do you see any uh, merits to that or, or how do you view that? Yeah, I think quite possibly. So uh, I've actually been looking at, at spectrum management for many, many years, both during my time at Ofcom and since. And in fact, published a book last year on spectrum management. Mm -hmm. and one of my key thinkings from that was that in general, we should make much more shared use of spectrum because that's so much more efficient. Mm -hmm. So it does seem to me that we should be looking at sharing spectrum, which means more than one licensed user in bands or on licensed users into licensed bands and so on. And we've had a number of concepts like TV white space, which hasn't yet really materialized, but that is effectively on licensed users sharing in licensed frequency bands. Mm -hmm. I mean, that idea is like licensed shared access, which is, licensed users share into licensed bands. So we've got the concepts of how to do this. They make a lot of sense, but we've not yet had the kind of um, business case that really makes it worthwhile moving ahead with it. But it seems to me that it would make very good sense for Wi-Fi to be one of the candidates that's shared in some of these bands, mm -hmm. and whether it's shared in an unlicensed sense into those licensed bands, or whether it is actually licensed in some way to provide some sort of differential quality of service type of Wi-Fi. I think that's open to question, probably a bit of both would make sense to try them both out and see how they play out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as mobile traffic or wireless traffic grows, one should think that the need for sharing as opposed to allocating more license spectrum is also growing, right? I mean, that's my logical conclusion. I don't know if you agree with that. Absolutely. And, and most regulators, I think, realize the same. And you see many, generic studies on sharing from Ofcom, from the European Commission and others that say mm -hmm. this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But of course it's tricky to do and the incumbents don't want it because they'd rather have it all to themselves. So it is going to take a while for confidence to build, for the cases to build, for the pressure for it to really need to happen to occur. Yeah. But I'm sure it will. I can't imagine that we will have less sharing in the future than we have now. It must be more sharing. Yeah. It's just the case of exactly where and when will happen to your hands. It's great to hear your views, and thank you so much for coming on. Uh, once again, we had you before uh, on here before talking about the 5G myth, and uh, I always follow your work. I think it's great, and I really appreciate it. Uh, William, before you go, if people want to uh, download and uh, study the report, this uh, it looks like this, I should say, the Wi-Fi Spectrum Needs Study, uh, they can go to the Wi-Fi Alliance website. Is that correct? That's correct. That's where they can get it. Yeah. And what we'll try to do is actually post a link to it as well. If that's possible, we'll find it with OCR uh, so we can get some more people reading this because it's really important. William, thanks once again. And please come back and see us soon. We'll do. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's it for this week's show. Big thanks to Dr. William Webb for joining us and for our next episodes, just so that you know, we'll, we've lined up Open Mesh. Adaptrum. It's uh, Adaptrum is a TV white space company, one of the leaders in that space, and ID Wave. And uh, that's all I have to say on this episode. Tune in again next time, and thank you for watching. Wi-Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi-Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi-Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.